Hello, everyone. Um, it's fantastic to have Luke Toymans here. Um, and I'd like to just, I'm not going to read his bio because it's so long, there'd be no time for the lecture. But I would say that of, in my 25 years of teaching, his, uh, his name has come up in painting crits tutorials more than anybody else's, which says something. Um, as they say, widely credited with having contributed to the right revival of painting in the 90s. I'd say it's more than that. It's not widely credited. It's for sure he's a major factor in that. And um, I first saw his work at the Hayward in Unbound in 93, and I've seen it regularly since. For example, the show at Tate Modern in 2004, an amazing show. And actually, just recently, he curated a show um, which at uh, Parasol Unit, a very interesting show of um, other artists, which is now in Antwerp. And um, anyway, it's absolutely fantastic to have Luke with us. And uh, welcome, Luke. Yeah, fine. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to... Well, thanks for coming. It's such a big, uh, big number of people. Uh, I won't do that. But uh, by now, of course, I'm really totally bored by talking about my work. You can imagine in thousands of lectures. Uh, but what I try to do is to also to make it interesting for myself is to talk about something but which is quite, well, well it, this show just ended, I think, uh, Saturday. It was a show that I was asked to do by uh, Her Excellency Shaika Mayasha, maybe some people know her. It's the daughter of the former emir and the sister of the new emir in Qatar. And we had a long talk because this, this show took about three years of preparation. It was very difficult to get the loans. People wanted terror insurance and, because, of course, it's a very conflictuous zone, as you know. It's also interesting to see that, I mean, the, the title of the show, and it was very precise, that, no, wait, the title of the show is this, Intolerance. I also painted it on the wall to make it very clear. They also asked me, why do you have the title intolerance? And I said, because there's also the word, the word tolerance in it. And there's also a film by W. Griffith, which was made in the 20s, I think, or no, 1916 or something like that, one of the first major feature films that was made, with a certain touch of Orientalism. But anyway, so, <laughs> so, the front is also, I decided myself, this is a temporary building. You have to imagine it. It's really in, insane. Also, the, the very first building that was there 19 years ago is the Sheraton Hotel, which is this sort of Mastaba building. There was nothing else. Like in 19 years, in the fast-forward situation, they created this. And I decided to do the show and make it the biggest show ever I did. And maybe it would have been seen by a lot of people. It would be seen by the people from Yemen, Lebanon, and out of the region. All that. But it was like a symbolical point to do it in a very, very difficult zone. But let's go to the show. I'll talk about the work separately because we will take them out. But I also will show you the installation shot. I have did about, about 125 solo shows, and I actually all installed them myself. Although in name, Lynn Cook did this show, but actually I installed it. Uh, because I think it's really important to make a sort of uh, yeah, correlation between the works also. Even when I decide on making a new gallery show, all the works have to be singular in their way, like valid. I mean, they should sustain themselves, but they should also make a vacuum in the show. Because I think gallery shows are still important. It's not a shop. It's the first time you show, actually, your new work, so to speak. With a museum-type like show, uh, that's no different, but it's different as a different scale. You will see this show is not constructed in a chronological way. It's like pockets of meaning. It was also a way to introduce more recent work and to let them have a touchstone with the older work and create different islands of meaning, so to speak. Although there is a specific way in the show, but I'll, I'll talk about it as we go by it. So this is a little bit closer up. So this is actually a sort of detail, not of a painting, but of a mural I made with chalk in the Haus der Kunst in Munich. The real painting is, though, inside of the building and is also owned by the Scheiker. This is the hallway, 
where I made the first wall painting. I made about six wall paintings. And this I did because we didn't get the work also. This is a sort of pragmatic solution to it. And it's based upon a work from 90 called Silence. It's about a, a, a kid's head. And it has this green and orange things above the eyelids that are closed. And it gives you the impression it could be alive or it could be dead. But that was in the bookshop. And then the entrance, as I said, I painted it again on the wall. This is one of the seven wall paintings I've made. And then the very first painting, which some of you may have seen in London, that was the last show I did, the second show already in the, in, in the David Swerner Gallery. I did the opening show, and this was this January. And this painting is called, as we can maybe get a close-up of it. Yeah, here you see a constellation with much older work, like embitterment, target, sif in the backdrop. All those elements also were important because it's interesting to play with the space and to let things enter and go out. All the see-through elements that you see are also specifically taken care of. So here you can see it solitary. So this painting I wanted to start with because when it was shown in London also, it immediately had a retraction towards something like terrible, something like, and it is also terrible, it's an execution, but it's no, not related to a contemporary execution, it actually comes out of a, a quite, quite a stupid movie called The Twist of Sand, which used to be a cult movie in 1968 about the war, and it's actually a submarine crew that comes out just to surrender, and then they just get shot, and this is the moment before they get shot. But by the fact that it's large, it's like three and a half meters, and it is also the, the figures are quite graphically depicted. You get an element that should even go to the element of terror and ISIS to a point. So that was interesting. What was also interesting was that the Sheikh, the Sheikh and the husband of Sheikh Amiasa wanted me to make something specifically about the region. And I said, in preparation to the show where we met a year or so before, I said, that's quite kind of difficult because, you know, your uh, brother, who is now the Emir, and your father, who used to be the Emir, put so much money... In, the, in mercenaries in order for the Arabian spring to turn into the Arabian winter, so that's like opening a can of worms. So I will make something for the region, which I did, and it's also in the show. It's a different type of work. But this is sort of correlated already to that word. To start with it, opposite of the word intolerance, I thought was quite an important thing to do. Here you get it a bit more closer. It was also... My fascination with, of course, the black paintings of Goya in a very strange way, which I always loved. And there is a more clearer deduction of that in the group of work, which is called the Arena, which will come later in the show. So, so did we start actually with the most recent work in the show and then go to... Are we, again, are we still there? Yeah. Jesus. What am I doing? Oh, I'm, do, I'm doing the wrong thing. Ah, ha, ha, see, I'm a sort of technical moron. Uh, here, and I'm going to take this closer, is a pretty old word from 86, I suppose. It's called Hotel Room. And it was based, and I think, that because in the show, I also made a dark room where you can see drawings, preliminary drawings, the drawings that are independent, maquettes, that inform the work. Because I think it was interesting, since it was the first time I showed it in this region, I didn't know how they would react to it. So I wanted to be it's as comprehensive as possible and also as complicated as possible, but give them all the different angles to which they could come back and forth to the image and the work. Because, of course, I was dealing and giving them an idea of Western image building, something they don't have. What you see here is the hotel room, which was born, an image that was born out of a fascination with hotel rooms. And it was literally based upon a drawing, which I said already, which is probably was also in this back room, which was based upon just the oil paint on paper. So the oil paint the, 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 the sort of crawls into the paper and erodes it in a sense. And I was always fascinated by hotel rooms because this is the type of room that you can mess up, but in the end it will restore its own order. So it's like this sort of totally antiseptic element. Then another painting which actually the Sheikh really liked is clearly a painting of a Middle Eastern man. It's called The Nose. It was painted after 9-11. And so after 9-11, every person that looked, and even now it's even worse because they're in Europe now. So uh, 
there is this sort of distinct, you know, like sort of paranoia just because of somebody who looks slightly Middle Eastern. On the other hand, there is an element of the Messiah in this with the open mouth and the eyes and things like that and the cut, how it's made. It's a very small painting, it's like this, but it's quite, quite monumental. Then, then we have an embitterment and target next to each other. Here you see it separately. This is an old one, this is from 90, and it's based on my height. And it was based upon the idea of stitched flowers, which I saw in a sort of reproduction on a tablecloth, which I then toppled and actually created with a deepening the idea of, of the orange into a sort of different space. It's a sort of like abstract, uh, it's like a vertebral column, it's like an abstract self-portrait, you could say. Oh, God, what am I doing now? Are we oh, yeah. Then we go into the second space, which is already a fault. And here already things crop up that actually indirectly do have to do with the region. We see an image of the prisons of war. We see an image of Miltir, the caps. And not Dubai, as the Minister of Culture of, uh, during the talk and the, the, the round, the, the walk we gave of Qatar thought, but that's actually Shanghai. But okay, we go closer to the caps. This was a painting which was made in 1996 for a show, actually the second show in New York. And it was called The Heritage. And it was also a show that came right after a show that it called Heimat, which was a show I did in Antwerp about Flemish nationalism and kind of like, uh, yeah, very xenophobe right-wing movement that uh, now virtually doesn't exist anymore, although it's been taken over by something that's even worse and more dangerous because it inco incorporated it, which is the new Flemish alliance. And, but that's the show in, 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 in Antwerp was called Heimat. That was about nationalism. And the show in the States could not be about nationalism because it's the melting pot. So it can only be about patriotism in a sense. And I therefore called the show The Heritage. I was trying to find icons within American society, <coughs> and one of the icons is the baseball cap. I sort of depicted it in a filmic sequence twice. In the one above, it's in cloth, and the one underneath, it's in leather. So it sticks out of the image and becomes a little bit more aggressive, in a way. Then the next image next to it is the Prisoners of War, a painting that was made in 2001, or two, and it was it was a deduction from the very first Gulf War, the one of Bush Senior. And I, I still remember when, when when the war started. I was really totally in anguish, you know, waiting at the television. And if, eventually, what we got was a sort of extended video game. It was nothing real. And all of a sudden, three quarters in the process of winning that war, there is this image that comes up of four captured pilots by the Iraqis. I think it was a Kuwaiti, that's an American, I suppose, and that was a, that was a Kuwaiti, that was, a, uh, that was an American, that was a British guy. So four pilots, clearly drugged, and they were on television. This was the only real image of that war that I saw, which was the only humanly real image, and therefore it clung with me, because it also shows you the distortion the media actually makes, in a sense. And it also embedded a fear in me, in me that eventually, although the war was won, so-called, in two weeks or whatever, or the happiest man in Baghdad, when Schwarzkopf pointed out the guy that could be able to cross the bridge before they just blew it up, uh, that type of thing didn't really work for me, because there was this element of the rhetoric, the Islamic rhetoric, who went over it, and actually has proven to be a bit more dangerous than we thought. Going back in time to something different, and this is the portrait of Miltier. This is actually comes out of the same show as the Caps, you know, the Heritage show, called Heritage Number no. 4. It's a depiction of, you know, the average, uh, average American dad, you know, like his eyes a little bit enlarged, the stupidity falls off it, but eventually <laughs> this was a Texan millionaire who was actually heading the Ku Klux Klan and was also... Uh, kind of entangled in all the conspiracy theories on the murder of JFK and sort of like very mysteriously burned down in his own house with him in it in 1978. So this was already the, the second room and we're going to go further 
is about these elements of topicality, in a sense. And that's how I sort of try to make the parkour of the show. Here you see another image from far away where you see Condoleezza Rice, ballroom dancing, about which we can talk a bit more specific when we get there, and Shanghai. Shanghai, morning sun, it's actually called. This is a picture I took through one of the rings, the metal rings uh, of, of the bridge at Shanghai. Since I was 15, I wanted to go to the Bund in Shanghai, and actually I did a project there, I think in 2006, the first project, a kind of long-standing history with Chinese motherfuckers. And so then uh, I finally get there, and, and it was a total disappointment. Not only because of the modern buildings, but especially because of the fact that you have a lot of expat restaurants, and once you try to get a cab, there are like 17 kids, like eight years old beggars trying to open the door of your cab. It was a very violent situation. But this was an image that I actually, because we stayed in the hotel, which I actually took, which was close to the bridge, on the other side from the new Shanghai, still in the old Bund, from this sort of similar image to what you could see in Doha or Dubai, this sort of modern cities that explode. I mean, the interesting thing with China is the way, is the scale of things, which is actually on the verge of insanity. And that, with the sort of mimicry of the idyllic sky, and also the fact that it displaces you in a sense. Well, let's go on, because it will take too much time. Uh, again? Okay. What, are, what am I doing now again? Ah, yeah. So this is, a, this is the orchid, Condoleezza Rice, and ballroom dancing. Let's go to ballroom dancing. So... This comes out, these two, I mean, the one that we're going to see after that, Condoleezza Rice and Ballroom Dance, come out of a show in 2005 called Proper. Uh, my wife and I, we were in the States, in New York, when it happened, 9-11, so we had first-hand recollection and experience. I wish it never did, because it was a really decisive turning point. If it was a mock-up or not, you just actually don't know. I mean, a lot of things went wrong that day. But anyway, so... After that, there was no, I, did, I, I, I didn't know what to do with it. Because, but after, to, uh, after 9-11, everything you did in New York, or in the States for that matter, had to do with paranoia. I mean, you couldn't get away with it. I mean, and also, uh, this is uh, the second part of the, of the, of the, of the Bush legislation. At that, until, at that point, actually, you could feel the physical stupidity even in New York. So there was this element of the, 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 the regression and the element of going to a very high level of conservatism, and that made me think of how, in 2005, could I react to that with a, call, with a show called Proper, which, of course, implies improper. And the first idea was to go back to Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. You know, like in the war times, there was this element of turning it into a more pinkish image and the element of, of ballroom dancing. But my wife and I, we were browsing on the web, and by accident, we found this specific image out of 2005 at the Governor's Ball in Texas on the Texas Seal. And that was exactly what I was looking for. The woman swaying her head, the guy in a tuxedo, this whole situation. It also sort of fascinated me because it made me withdraw to the element of uh, Peter de Hoog and, you know, the Dutch school. When I still remember when I was painting the red and make it more and more red of the woman, it was like I was going around it, like you were actually grabbing a vase or something like that. And that same week, actually, I came to this image. Because one of my best friends used to be the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Karl Gucht. He is now actually working for the European community. And he made kind of a sexist remark in the newspaper. So I was sitting in a bar where nobody went, because then I'm not bothered. And, and I was reading the newspaper, and I was reading this article about my friend who said, the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, that Condoleezza Rice was going to visit our country, and that she was actually quite smart and not unpretty. So that's it. That's the real thing. I mean, sort of the, 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 the aberration within this legislation, or the Bush legislation, and also the fact that this woman is so extremely self-contained. You couldn't know, and we still don't know what she would add up or what, what she added up to, anyhow. 
And I thought that was really a, mis- a good point in terms of the fact that it could be criticized, could not, because I think it's important for a work of art that it should never have a moral stance. It should never be one way. It should go in its ambiguities, ambiguity in different layers, in a sense. So I was truly, truly fascinated by it. I depicted it, took it actually from a website, and it depicted the face as on a flat screen. Now, the face is about this big, which is not a big painting, but if you would put the whole woman around underneath it, it would be a giant. And the, the thing was, when it was shown in the preview uh, in New York, a lot of museum people came, and they let out a shriek, because, of course, it was very topical. She was still the Secretary of State. But nevertheless, overnight, Glenn Laurie of the MoMA, and this is, speaks for his intelligence, said the MoMA has to buy it. You know, we have to get it, because when it gets into a public collection, it could be misunderstood. There were a lot of Republican collectors that phoned David, my, my, my dealer, and said, we'll never buy a painting of Luke Timmons again. And, but then, years later, when the same painting was on travel in an, uh, the tour I did in, in five, four, four American institutions, museums, where we hit Dallas, and my assistant and I had just finished putting up my show. We went to the Kimberley Museum, which is a museum that only collects until the 19th century, and on leaving that museum, there's a sort of Navy SEAL-like type comes out of the office, which happens to be the director. And he says to me, Mr. Timons, it's such a shame we cannot collect above the 19th century because what you did for <coughs> Condoleezza Rice is what Andy Warhol did for Marilyn Monroe. So it goes both ways. So this is the, this is the interesting element of this thing. And the good thing of Glenn Lorian's intelligence was that it was a public figure. It also has the size of a flat screen in a way. Yeah, we can still... Here you see other works, another see-through space. Quite a big space. It's quite a generous space, in a sense. You see an empty slide, of which I don't think we go close up to that. And then you see uh, the rumor, which is a thing I will talk about later. And toys. We'll come back to that later. This is a painting from 90. This is a church that was still under construction coming out of the modeling world. It's a quite small painting, and as I said, it's a maquette of a maquette, because it was not ready yet when this picture was published. It's my fascination with things that are small, because there is an omnipotence with things that are small, because you can rearrange them to a point that you can do whatever you like, you know, so you can overpower the situation. That combined with two other pictures who are about domesticity, which is plates on a wall, like glazed plates, just fascinated with the color, the, the, the warmth. There's also an element that's important is that <coughs> pictures have a temperature. They can be cool, they can be warm. And what was also interesting in this show for me to see is to see all these words mixed up, not that that didn't happen in the Tate Modern show because that was the same thing. Still, I still remember I had a great fight with Nick that I didn't do it in a chronological way or about the wall text and all that, but nevertheless... That all worked out. But this is quite large. It's like a show with 100 paintings, 80 drawings, maquettes, and wall paintings. So it's quite a full-spectrum situation. But it was interesting to see these things again because I, also for me, it, uh, well, not that I'm amazed by seeing it again, but I'm sort of bored in a sense too. But on the other hand, there is an element of aging going on, which is going uh, surpassing myself in a sense. And also the thing is that it shows you you can never go back in painting. You know, you can never make... I could copy this. I could make this, but it would never have the same intensity. I think this is the real primordial elementary point of painting. You can reassess something, what you've made, an older work, or regroup it, or make a detail out of it. But to make the exact same work is going to be very, very difficult, I think. And that's one of the beauties, that's the that's beauty of painting, in the sense that it has this decisiveness within the fact that it's, of course, quite corporal, and it has all to do with timing, precision, and intensity. This is The Rumor, which is a painting that comes up a show called The Rumor, which actually was shown in 2001, I suppose, at Jay Joplin in, in, in Hoxton Square. And it was actually uh, based upon a show of a portrait and pigeons. Pigeons, for me, are flying rats. And uh, this portrait had to be a portrait of authority, in a sense. Because the pigeons, 
I mean, how the show came out was quite specific. It came about the fact that my wife and I did a couple of trips to France and to Britain in particular, and we actually visited these, uh, these like these castles, and, and every time we visited, it was this sort of pantheon-like building in front of it. I was amazed, and I didn't know what it was, so I went in the third time. We visited one of those places, and there was this French father with this kid explaining to the kid, like, if you would sort of multiply the holes, vertic- the vertical holes and the horizontal holes in that sort of like pantheon-like uh, structure, you would get the amount of acres that the landowners own, which means, of course, the landowners owned the people who worked on it, and they were not able to own pigeons, it was livestock, but they were also messengers. So with the outbreak of the French Revolution, the first thing they did was kill all the pigeons. So that reconfirmed my idea of the flying rats, in a sense. And therefore, I had to make this image, uh, quite a large painting, actually, this image of this authoritarian figure, which could be a statesman, it could be... It became actually a combination of Adenauer, Mitterrand, and Giscard d'Estaing, all in one, in one image. That's another shot of the room. And then this is an image that came out of the same show as the Condoleezza Rice thing, the proper room, but had to deal with the idea of surveillance and the viewing point of a dog. Like you're as low as a dog, it's called the park. It's a, it's a specific element of nature and paranoia, in a sense. And now, where are we now? Some more installation shots. And then this is the title piece of the show, Intolerance. It came out of the same show as the one with the tiles, which was a show which was actually built up in the old gallery only on the chimney walls. Out of my fascination with the idea that these mantelpieces look like altars. I come from a very Catholic country. I mean, Belgium is entirely Catholic, which makes us completely different from the Dutch, although my mother was Dutch. So I'm the best of both worlds. But the thing is that there is a distinctive difference. I mean, the Dutch are very tall and live in small houses. We are smaller, more perverse, and live in bigger houses. I mean, so luxury is really a thing. And so also we really like to keep the motherfuckers down with the image. So that is good. So in that sense, I resembled all the candlesticks of my mother with the most ugly one from the 70s, which is a period I hate, in the middle. And I painted it, and when I finished painting it, I said, shit, that looks like Morandi. <laughs> Which it does, in, in a way. It's just not that I don't like Morandi, I do like Morandi, a very tall guy who actually made very small paintings. <laughs> I wrote a very interesting little text about him called, uh, it's called uh, My Name is Nobody, which you can find back in On and By where I have my grievances towards him, because, of course, Morandi is a great painter. I mean, you can really... But you can understand it. I mean, it's no big deal. I mean, you can make a Morandi every fucking day, but, which he did, maybe. But it also has a boring element to it. It looks great in a Michelangelo Antonioni movie. But anyway, so I, I made this and I said, shit, this looks like a Morandi. But on the other hand, there was the element of the intolerance. You know, I come back to the sort of more religious uh, point in basing up and actually putting all these things on the mantelpiece, that's where you put also (coughs) the pictures of the children or the family members or whatever. uh, But that came out of that fascination. So this quite, let's say, not very violent, peaceful, rustic image, for me, was a very violent image in a very sense. I mean, because it had to do with education, restriction, and bloody awful and ugly. So, yeah, we, we had that again. That comes again. Shit. I mean, another time, the slides, the slides were actually coming out of a show with monkeys. And the show was called Nothing. But not really like the philosophical nothing, but like really nothing. And it was also my idea, just to, there were three of them. We didn't get them all. We got one. Just projected an empty slide on the wall and this was also my fascination with Rotko, in a sense. And, yeah. Then we go to a, another space with all the work. Work that comes from 94. I think that is even older. It's from 90. And it's called Child Abuse. 
So actually, you can also see back and forth a different way of painting or handling the paint. You will see that during the course of time, the stroke will become more nervous and shortened in a sense. And of course, the sizes will differ. Because all these paintings that I like, especially these, were all painted in a very small space which went from there to here. And, and had windows over there, and the height was very limited. So I was limited in my space. And therefore, also that, 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 that also has an impact on how you see things. Not that that necessarily makes painting lesser or important. I think scale is something that has to be decisively thought of and felt. And I very early on also with these paintings. I, I made a couple of paintings that were unframed paintings, but at a very early on stage, and this was before 90, in 86, I decided to paint on just a piece of canvas nailed to the wall. Because that gave me the opportunity to, for, until the last instance, to change the size. So that means that virtually no painting has the same size, which I think is really important. And it's only when it comes on the frame that it becomes an object. When you would see the images, I mean, are the paintings when they're still unframed, just on a, on a canvas on the wall, you have, it's like you see more. When they get on a frame, they become such an object, it's like a second veil or a skin comes in front of it and makes it a different situation, which I always find fascinating. Anyway, this painting was based upon publicity. All these little newspapers, what you see is a stylized tulip, a cat litter box, and a guy mowing the lane, and two dots to keep the information going. And I just put that all together as an intuition with these colors, which are quite translucent and, and, and violent in a sense. And when my wife saw this, she thought about some kind of abuse, so she called it child abuse, and that's where the title actually comes from. Then the next one is. Uh, one of the henchmen of Hitler, this is Ribbentrop. Actually here in London, by the way. He used to be stationed not so far away from the mall. But this was just a fascination of this sort of vintage photograph, in a sense also, with the light playing in it. Of course, Caspar David Friedrich, all these elements that are never far away. And then another installation shot where you see toys and pillows. And we think we're going to go close up to the toys. This is a painting where you can, with airfix models, you know, you could, I once altered, you could, with a paste, you could alter the, 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 the figurines. Again, the same fascination, the smallness, blowing it up. And then pillows, which comes out of a porn magazine. I didn't want to depict the porn because it's uh, difficult. Not that it's timeless, but it's just difficult. And, but I want, it was a very badly printed porn magazine, so we went out of, you know, like, the, 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 the outlines. It was all blurred and all that. So I just multiplied one thing of it, which is the pillows, which is a non-formal thing. It takes the shape of everything that falls on it. And I found that kind of f fascinating. And also the idea of extrapolizing the light, like the green that beams out. And so there's no more negotiating the rest of the painting. Then the whole battery of these toy paintings. I'm going to show you fast one after the other. You can see approximately the size. This is called the cry. Of course, also coming out of the fascination with Hopper. When I did the show in the Tate Modern, it was adjunct to the space of Hopper. So I was quite afraid because Hopper was one of my heroes. And so I made a point of having these toy paintings in the show. But in a very little corridor, going from very small paintings to the largest painting in the show at that point was the still life. I actually saw my first hopper in the Hayward Gallery when I was 17 in London, and it was a guy getting out of a theater. I didn't only see it, I also felt it. It was like in the back. It was a show about American art. I didn't know who hopper was. So I found in four I found the same day I found the book, was really happy with it. And also the fact that for me, Hopper is not art, it's a toy. There's an element of the toy. And that fascination with toys and Hopper sort of informed itself. So that's another sidetrack of it. So here you see the cry, the swimming pool. 
Of course, you see that something is wrong because the figurines are too big and there's a sort of disproportionate uh, sort of size between all the things that exist. And this were also the more colorful paintings that I painted in 90. And it was interesting because people loved the other, the other paintings but thought they were all gray or gray tones. And when they saw this, it was the second show in my gallery in Antwerp, they were shocked and they hated it. But from then on, they also understood that the former paintings did have a color or a tonality that had an element of temperature into it. This had to be harsh because it's plastic. Suspended, the family, and then you have one more, it's called the murderer. And we go further. This, that's the opposite of the space. So I hope you can sort of like, was making a sort of parkour through the show now. And this comes out of a whacked out animation film about the, Mor the Mormons. You should see it. It's an animation film. It's totally insane. Uh, <clears throat> and so this is the beginning of the film, you know, and that's the trying to figure out that Joseph Smith goes all the way back in Lineage to Jesus, which, of course, is not true. Uh, the, uh, there is this element. Yeah, it's, 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 it's racist. It's insane. You should look at it. It's really fun to look at it. But this is one of the very first. But, of course... There is this disnifying or disnification in the work already, which is also another fascination that will be built up in this show as the sort of rotating motor of it. But we'll come to that later on. So Then there's a whole space which was dedicated to where I come from, which is about this Flemish nationalism. You see the Flemish intellectual, the Flemish flag, the Iron Tower... We'll talk about some things in depth. This is the Iron Tower. This was a monument built after the First World War. It was a, a, a pacifist monument. It was built because the footmen were, of course, all farmer sons. And the upper class was all French spoken, which were, of course, the officers. And a lot of people got killed because they didn't understand the command. When, the French, when they were said in French by the, the commanding officers, à gauche, you know, they went the opposite way, straight into German machine fire. Out of that, <coughs> a group of French intellectuals who then started, of course, to write in Flemish and so on, created a movement called the Flemish Movement. Out of that, there was this monument that came up after the First World War, which said everything for Christ and Christ for the Flanders, of course, very decisive thing, which, between the two world wars, became a fascist symbol of the new order and then was blown up, and this has all to do with collaboration. It's a very, 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 you know, like deep and difficult story to talk about. But, uh, but anyway, so I made this deduction of a four, you know, the new order thing, the brown element, the gold, and a sort of stigmatized and uh, reductive uh, idea of a monument, which was repeated actually in the other image, which is called the Flemish Intellectual, which was a sort of regional author who became really famous during the Second World War, also because he collaborated, was actually translated in German and apprehended after the war for it. But this is the idea of nationalism in the sense that it has no face. It looks like a sculpture, a bust, something that's snowed under in a sense, and only sort of like the basic elements <coughs> remain visible. And this continues with, like, the village. You know, I was really uh, criticized by these Flemish blog guys, you know, by this uh, Flemish xenophobe party of making art for the few and not for everybody. So I made the art about their idyllic state of a village, which is with cracks and everything in it and, 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 and the sort of color that makes you puke. And so... And I also went to all these symbols that they, they, they didn't want to deal with anymore, so that, that was exactly what it was like. And it had cr quite a big effect. So uh, most of the difficult paintings were bought by the Flemish community. We have, of course, the Flemish community. We have Brussels and the Walloon community. And they were actually literally sort of hidden away, like in embassies. And it's only now that they just became back part of the collection of museums and things like that. The Green Room, which is some kind of a follow-up of the gas chamber in a sense, because it deals with claustrophobia. It's just a chair and a table, and it's on the verge of abstraction. Fingers, fingers, spitzen, it's about this idea of, you know, like, 
the stickiness of things. There's another one more close. And then we are at the room where I did five wall paintings in two days. Uh, I work very fast and very intense. I mean, every painting is also painted in a day. Now, well, these wall paintings were like two or three a day. So it was, and I painted them because these were paintings I wanted to have for the show, but couldn't get my hands on. And what I decided is not to paint the paintings again on the wall. Also, you have to understand that this is temporary. They will be destroyed after the show. I've already made about 89 to 90 of these paintings that have been destroyed. They will only become apprehensive when we make a publication of it within this in a couple of years. And, but I wanted to have these paintings. But, so I thought it was quite idiotic to repaint them on the wall because, of course, the painting has colors. And, and I said, I'm going to make a restriction to the idea of ink, and I'm going to go back to the photographic image from which they were taken. taken. So we're much more closer to the photographic image. So this one, which you see from afar, that's the plant where the Israelis make the nuclear missiles. And this was a painting based upon was, was the preliminary information for a painting called Demolition. We're going to go closer. Yeah, here you can see it. So these clouds, you see the lantern posts, flat posts, the only indications of a real space. Then you have, as I said, this sort of nuclear plant, and all in the same blue, in a sense, because of the reminiscence to ink. This is a further away, so you can see how it conjuncts with the other works. Oh, this is a blank. We have blanks, I don't know. And this, this is, uh, th there's also a painting that I didn't get, which is a painting called Navy Seals, which was a, an image of the second Gulf War, where you can see these Navy Seals, and they've just conquered one of the palaces of one of the sons of Saddam Hussein, and uh, one of the guys smoking a cigarette, and they're standing there. And this gave me some kind of, like, very first World War feeling, you know, the idea of occupying, taking over the space. And then, right before the Gulf War, there's also a painting that exists of this. And this is actually a sort of cut I made in a press photographer, a press photography of, uh, this was right two or three days before the second Gulf War started. And it was the last attempt of Mubarak to sort of appease it. So the hand that sort of weakened on the piece of the, uh, on the one side, the side of, the, of the seat, and the one that's sticking out, which is Powell and Mubarak. So it was an interesting image, you know, the decorum, the glass table, something official and something terrible at the same time. And then there is the remaining image, oh, wait, which is this one, which is the C. Then apparently we have another blank, I see. Yeah. One of the second large spaces. This is an image that comes out of a show called uh, the summer is over. I give my shows titles. I think it's important. I also give my paintings titles, because I also think that's important, because sometimes it has nothing to do with the work. It's just another image. This specific uh, show that I made was the summer is over was about everything in my vicinity. My self-portrait, the, 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 tr the sort of trajectory I do on foot to my studio, which passes by the backside of the zoological garden, of which this is one of the windows. And it was all about this idea of the stupidity of the artist looking at his own work and the wrong romanticism, in a sense. And so this painting is called Zoo. You can see it. I think it's actually, it's a bit bigger than the size you see it here. It's not about daylight, it's actually at night, this, this light. This is another view of the space in which these paintings are. And here, gradually, the idea of religion crops in. This is the head, or the, this is, it comes out of show of 2006. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> and it's actually called Restoration. This is the, I mean, the death mask of Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, 
I come out of a country where the elite is been to one school, which is the Jesuit school. May it be Jan Hut or Tom Barman from Deus or whatever. Anybody who's important, I came out of the wrong social layer that was not enabled to go there, but I'm able to sort of recognize them. So they have a quite a distinctive education because it's built upon deduction. It has an element of humanism, and it has even an element of the utopic, but of course it also has a hidden agenda. And this was their main character, the warrior, you know, like the knight who became the founder of that specific order. Which is interesting because now, if you think of it, there's always been quite some animosity between the Vatican and its soldiers, I mean the Jesuits, who were people that were extremely prepared and talking about colonialism, they were actually so apt that they could one-handedly, they could actually sort of convert entire regions. But they were also prepared. They would learn the language and they would prepare themselves. And now, it's very strange because the new pope we have is the first Jesuit pope there ever has been. So we might have an intelligent pope. Uh, <coughs> and this is just another image of Christianity, you know, the bush, based upon the embroidery, but also the bleeding out, which, of course, it makes a reminiscence to sacrifice and blood. Then, the next two guys, Peter and Paul, they come out of a show called The Passion Play, which was made in 1999. And I have to say, at that point, I was totally unaware about the fact, and I was, I, I, I thought it would never be possible that religion would have such an importance again. I could only look at it as a sort of form of cosmetic. And this whole show was based upon the Passion Place, which I visited with my parents in 1974, which is a seven-hour Passion Play, which long time it takes a long time. And it's still at that point, like, the villagers would play, like, Christ and Peter, uh, John and Peter and Paul and all that. And with the beards would be glued on, so you would get this quo vadis effect, you know, as uh, this sort of Charlton Heston thing, but then in the mountains in Germany. And I love that, because I, and I took this imagery and also... The fascination with the sort like the Han van Meegere, you know, the, the guy who falsified the MLs gangers, the famous falsifier. And if you look at the van Meegere now with the Boma and Bernie, you see how stiff it's painted, you know. By no means that could be Johannes Vermeer. Technically, it was made in such a way that he fooled the Germans with it. But anyway, so it also made me, enabled me to make this very bad ana ana anatomy, you know, like just and disguise it, you know, with the robes and give it this stiffness, which I found quite interesting and awkward in this Van Mega situation. But it was actually a joke, you know. So it was never, it was not taking religious, like, serious. As I said, I was not, I, I, I was totally unaware about the fact that that would become again, and is actually a factor that is so predominantly important. The next one is gold. Gold is the most mystical material. It's also, of course, is a, a sort of backlash or a sort of uh, <coughs> a blink of the eye towards the resonance, you know, the gold painting or the with real gold then of Eve Klein. On the other side, you have Loyola, the Jesuit church, and Double Sun. And we go to the Jesuit church. This is, this is about the size of the painting. It's a painting for a show in Japan. And it was painted after uh, a photograph I took in a church in Croatia. So not really like a big Jesuit church, but dealing with the Baroque. And so what you see uh, in the church itself, the only thing that's real is the altar and the paintings, and the rest is all like trompe l'oeil, it's painted on the wall. And I actually sort of duplicated that by putting it into a painting. And later on, I also translated the painting in an eight meter long wall painting in the show that I did at the National Gallery in the Sagenta in Poland, because we didn't get the painting from Japan. But it was interesting in making this painting, and I was never a great adversary of the Baroque. I'm also not a great fan of Rubens, although I come out of Antwerp. I think the women are too fat. And, but, of course, you cannot deny the fact that Rubens is a major artist. I mean, a major artist in the sense that he was the first filmmaker. He was the first Cecil B. the Mill. He also came at the point when there was actually the Counter-Reformation and a great deal was broken and sort of like disfigured. And he was able to refill 
from a distance, churches, and sort of like uh, rekindle this idea of Western image building. While making this painting, though, drawing it, because what I do, I don't project, but I make first a sort of white color, because I can't work on a white canvas directly. It has to have paint on it. But that white is not even really white. It is already a tone. It has a temperature. It, would have, it will have uh, an element of red or a, a different tones that will go in it to give it the right temperature. And then I would, dr I would draw in it and then ev erase the pencil drawing and then actually start to paint with the lightest stone and in the latest instance, the contrast would go in. But I'm very afraid to go over my contrast also. But by just making the drawing, I really have to admit that the Baroque is quite complex. I mean, it's a lot of stuff. You have to, and the way it is actually produced is that it's like a rocket. It will go up. It's a vertical assessment of the imagery, which I then again, I have to say, found fascinating. Well, this is again the wall. <coughs> again, the gold. But, but what am I doing now? I'm making this. Yeah, I'm going back. Yeah, double sun. As an image, I actually photographed and saw a double sun. And because, of course, with the idea of the revelation, there is always the idea of light. And I thought that sort of rekindled the idea of spirituality in a very strange way. And especially this image, because it's an enigmatic image, because it's a double image. And the idea of light. Light became, especially from that point on, quite important in the work. Light in terms of the projected light, light that is behind something, emitting it. Um, actually, the thing that becomes, again, more filmic, and since I had this filmic experience, there was this residue just lingering on. Then I think this is in the same space opposite and more recent work like the panel, which again is about light because it just takes out the figures. You know. <coughs> there are no faces, no trace to be seen. It's just a sort of spotlight and it has a corporate feel to it. It comes out of a show called Corporate. Then a small painting is the painting of Himmler. It's based on a painting that was cut out of magazines about this size. And I tried to sort of bring it back to the real size, how it would have hung at the office of Richard Heydrich, the second in command of Himmler, as the sort of official portrait. With the frame, you know, and the shadow, and this ghost-like element, like it could step out of this situation. You see again another shot. And then we go into the motor. This is the main space. I had it painted in the blue, which is the same blue as the outside. It was important to sort of like turn the inside out and the outside in. Like a casbah in a sense also. It's the only circular space in the space. And it had to work as a rotating space. And here I opted for the choice of nearly reconstructing one show fully, which is, the called, which is called the show Forever, the Management of Magic. And it was based upon the fascination with Walt Disney. Not Walt Disney with Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, but actually Walt Disney and Disneyland. The idea of incarcerating people's fantasy in a territorial given way so to control them, which I found fascinating. The imagery that you see here is actually deleted from their website because this was the first day where everything went wrong. And the image you see is Alice in the, the entrance of Alice in Wonderland, which comes also on the facade, as I said, as an insert of that. Uh, a lot of technicalities and problems arose, and so it was shut down. And he redid, because he was a perfectionist, he redid it again a couple of months later. And then, of course, it was perfect. The other image is an image of an ideal city he fortunately was not able to build. It's the turning wheel. I mean, I think, I think if you would, if we, we, Walt Disney would still be alive, would turn around his grave to see that there would be a Disney world in Paris. He would have never allowed for it. Also, this city, Epcot, which I said luckily was never built, with the main 
building in the, in the middle and the houses around it, and oh, there were tunnels underneath, you know, dividing, you know, the luxury traffic from the, the trucks and all the other things that deliver stuff. It was a quite a sort of totally controlled environment. He also, in order to get that, to, to get that sp- particular spot, he flew over the States to find that particular spot where he was going to do it, and also brought everything around it so there were no whorehouses, casinos, like, of course, a rose around Disney World, this would not happen twice. It's a sort of floating, you know, like, it's like, it's like a flying saucer in a way. Uh, this is Wonderland more close up. It's about, it's quite sizable. It's about, I think, five meters in length and three and a half meters high. So you can really, like, walk into it. That's another blank. Yeah, those are two other. This is the first Pixar uh, animation that was made. Then they threw the guys out and then they had to buy them back later on. Again, a blank. Hi, hi. Here, the same sizable picture. It's a turtle made out of light bulbs who also collapsed at the opening. I mean, you can see two kissing people in it, you can see Mickey Mouse in it, but no, it's just a turtle. But the most interesting thing is, of course, with this show is the fact that they in this space, and they were encased, they looked like projected spaces. They looked totally unreal. Now, as I pointed out, the city of Doha, in 19 years, has had a fast-forward development. So I actually thought this idea of Disney World was kind of in tune, which was the city that was surrounding it. And therefore, I also was an advocate to have that one painting, Alice in Wonderland, stay there in their collection, which it did. And it's in its place, because it's about this sort of, it is quite uh, fascinating what these people are doing there. As I said, with no culture or no backbone of a culture, on the other hand, they're not trying to victimize themselves, and they're trying to go for the most intelligent, intelligent Gulf state, more, most cultivated one, too, in 2013, which is admirable, might be a little bit naive, though. But, I mean, the thing is just that, therefore, this disney vacation element, I thought, as in junction with the idea of religion and Western image building, in that sense came, in this circular space, into a collision. Here you see some more, and then we get another blank, I see. Yeah, up. Magic, this is a sort of like <coughs> hologram of a figure, you know, ringing a bell. <coughs> a doll, actually. And so on. Some more shit. Some, oh, yeah, a lot of pictures of that. Uh, yeah, okay. This is then the space behind it. And some may or may not remember this. The first show at David Swerners was a whole lot of these paintings called Allo, which was based upon a parrot that uh, is no longer alive. It used to be in the bar in Antwerp, and it would come in at the same colors, you know, like yellow, blue, and red. And when you would come into the bar, it would say Allo. So that's where it actually comes from. And this stupid movie that was once made, a little bit half based upon the. <coughs> upon this, the life of, of, of Gauguin, from, and uh, The Moon and Sixpence, of course, also based upon a writer. But it was one of the first Hollywood productions, friend. I think Sand, George Sanders played the, the main character, which is a sort of egotistic, uh, obliterating artist, who then in the end, of course, was sort of like uh, forgiven in terms of the work and all that. But this is at the far end of the movie. The movie sucks, but I mean... It's in black and white, but to the far end, and I still saw that, and this comes out of an old childhood memory. I saw it on the, the television set of my parents. I still remember when television told color. I mean, I still remember when we didn't have television, that my parents took me to, like, a theater at the weekend to see the news. So when we got the television, this was a big, big thing. And therefore, for me, I'm really part of a television generation, which means a manco, an experience and a an indulgence in terms of, like, visual, in a sense. But, but, but still, when the, t- the television turned color, 
that was an event that was really something amazing. So, bearing that in mind, being much, much later, of course, there was already a long time color television, there was this one movie they played, and it was all black and white, and in the end, uh, so the main character's already dead, and his indigenous wife is rolling in the sand, and then there's this sort of like German, this doctor with a German, thick German accent in English, that his doctor that comes to the village, and he goes into the hut, and bang, it's all color. And then you see all these stupid copies of, of like in the Hollywood way of this sort of Gauguin-like kitsch, you know. That was what the show was about. It was also the first show of David, his new shop, I mean, his new gallery in London. And uh, which, which I found quite fascinating. But also, this was the first time I painted the different way around. I first painted this with the contrast and then painted the color into it. I had to. I had to create a different stance to how I would deal with this image in terms of this lit-up idea of, of the projection, which on the one hand is not about depth. It's actually about flattening and killing off the image. Then the next image, a doll's head. I've painted a lot of doll's heads. Uh, this is the one which is damaged. You can see it on the top. <laughs> this is the idea, of course, of the sort of fucked up idea of innocence. And, and also correlates to the wall painting, the silence painting. So there are things that sort of reoccur and come back as an anthem. It's another image of a space with two images called Against the Day. It comes out of a show that was all dealt about things that I would set into a pose or that would be virtual reality or what would be still on construction on websites, or it had to do with uh, reality TV, I mean, all those elements. And this was the starting point of two images next to each other. I asked a colleague of mine to just, sh with a shuffle, shuffle around my garden at night, and then the second image shows him losing the spade. And... It is actually those two images sort of react in a way like you have the two bars on your television set, the remote control, to pause in a way. It's the element of pause. Okay, you can get out of there. Whoop. Another part. Quite interesting. This is a triptych. A triptych I'm going to show you called Heilicht. It's the first one. It comes out of, is based upon photography from Dr. Wolf of 1948. I was amazed by the orangey color, the warmth and all that. The second one is smell, and the third one is touch. And they make a triptych in ones. This colorated nearly in terms of color with the image of a cook. The thing that I wanted to paint in 86, but I couldn't. So it took me till 2000 and, what was it, 2012? and a different size to be able to do it. Then another image, which my wife owns. This is my leg. It's called my leg in an Eames chair. You should see the leg, part of the leg, part of the carpet, the leather of the chair. Wrapping paper from the day to year. We're going to go a bit faster because I think we're running out of time. Anyway, so, drop, no, wait. Drum set. I'm going to show, I show this because... I'm also going to show the maquette from which this was derived and the Polaroids I took for it in order to create and make it. I'm going to go a bit faster. Another installation shot, another installation shot. Dead skull. I'm not going to talk about it. It's a sort of barrelief out of which I actually made a square in granite stones about 40 by 40 meters in front of the master museum at the river in Antwerp. It's a commemorative plaque which is like uh, as a barrel, you have had to, it's also a painting, of course. This is now the National Gallery in Washington. Okay. Another hotel room, this time a bit more elaborate, with the ashtray. I mean, that becomes really a problem, you know, because uh, I'm really, uh, I'm be trying to find a hotel for me in New York. My next show opening is it's finished, but the opening is in May, and they can't find a hotel room where you can smoke. 
So I'm deciding I might not want to go anymore to New York. <laughs> Fuck that. So, in a sense, this is the typical, you know, Roman aspect, you know, of very American, you know, this sort of typical antiseptic, a lot of carpet, sterile, and at the same time it has this sort of Twin Peaks shit going on. And I also made it nearly it's bigger than as you see it here, so you can virtually sit in, in the couch. found that important because, again, this, this, this type of space has an element of anguish, and at the same time it has this very strange, vulgar attraction that goes with it. Then the green plant, which was based upon just a paper out, cut out paper plant with green foliage in front of it, just to make it like poisonous in a way. And so we can go on. Yeah, this is the, di well, uh, the diagnostical view. This is, a lot of people talked about it. This is about a handbook for medical students to derive a diagnosis from. This is a woman, it's not self-portrait, the woman has cancer. And uh, I cropped the image in such a way and I changed the, the way of the gaze. So that you will not, as a spectator, will be allowed to have any empathy for the sick person that's been depicted. It's the other way around. It's too hard. It's also one of the most naturalistic paintings I've ever made. And it's the first time I sort of put the paint in the horizontal lines on the surface in order to flatten it out, but also to make it impossible to penetrate. So these are, as I say, the most naturalistic paintings, and therefore they're missing the real the totally, because they're actually totally symptomatic. And that was the urge of it. And they were shown in 92. It was also quite a shock for the audience because it was, yet again, something like a step in a different direction. More, that's the only one that looks at you, in a way. Eczema. And then, pretty old painting, 85. Made after the film adventure and made as an enlargement of a decoupage drawing of something I filmed, which was a room with a chandelier. Nothing in this painting is spontaneous, you know. The pencil lines, you know, you see, I actually sort of like, with the pencil in the wet paint, made the sort of rectangular lines with print on the paper, and the pencil lines, the ballpoint lines, the fountain pen lines, they were all meticulously monkeyed out and enlarged. And that was great. That was the first time I could actually, I found out there and then I had the exact distance to go on. Because, I mean, things like the diagnostic view I wanted to paint in 1978, but it just was too close to the painting. It was too suffocating. And there was all this sort of romanticism going on and this sort of, like, tormented whatever bullshit. And luckily somebody gave me a camera to make me look through a lens and to get me that certain certified distance. Important is always when you make a painting, and I don't know if you do, but a lot of painters, I mean the most I know, and I do for sure, always have a mirror. The mirror, if it's a standing mirror, but also a hand mirror, which takes the things on the head, but can double the distance. It's important to have this distance. I think part of the meaning of my work is also the distance measures towards the, mean, the image and the spectator itself. It's an important juxtaposition. And, as I said, an image should always work from close up. It can disintegrate, but it has to work from out of a distance. So more shots. We can go on like that. Now, here we have some things that came up with the Allo show, which are all about Technicolor. This is like, there are also wall paintings made of this, which are permanent in the theater in Dresden. This is Peaches from 1913. That's based upon the very first filmed sort of color imagery. And flowers. And then Perfume bottles. They really liked this in Doha. One of the guys in white liked it. He said, because, of course, because it's sort of like made him think of a cityscape, but it's not. The perfume bottle sort of took this sort of weirded out place. Because it was also made in that sense as an irony, because at first when I was asked to make something about the region, I was thinking about Doha and the Wizard of Oz, in a sense. So and th that's where the perfume bottles came in. Anyway, you can go on. The worshipper, you see, and then a virtual office. It's about size. It doesn't exist. It's a computer image. Totally blanked out in terms of color. And then you have blood stains through a microscope. 
which is funny because it's the same thing. Then you have a sort of folkloric parade that the Gilles de Bernes and we'll, we'll move on. Yeah. And then, that's a blank. We're in the space of the paintings that I've made for the region. And these are based upon actually film footage that I made in the 80s of the oldest work, the arena that was also and is was also in the show. The arena is a work I made in 78, was the first idea to sort of contemplate about the idea of violence and a filmic image. It was a mixed media image, it was partially cut out figures of a magazine of 1942 of boat people who were fleeing their countries, a Greek arena, a person looking at it through this sort of thing. And so it was this mixed media. But I remember that I, I filmed it. And when I was asked this thing about the region, I tried to figure out what, what could we do, what kind of imagery could we come up with. And after this visit in Doha in preparation to the show, my wife and I uh, went to visit friends in Madrid for Christmas, and I went to look at the dark paintings, Pintura Negras, of, of Goya. And especially one which is sort of like a floating figures in the sky, one with scissors and, and, and a sort of looking glass, gave me the idea that has to do something with the region. And I remembered, in the tonal zone, these images that I filmed. So I made film stills of that and made a whole series of it. So with the shifting of the light. And that gives them this Goya-esque sort of feel, which I'm so fascinated with because Goya, I think, is one of the most difficult and irritating painters on the globe. I mean, Morandi you could understand, but Goya is a bit more harsh and difficult, I'd say. And not at, not at all is very good because I saw the show of the portraits here in the National, in the National Gallery. It was, I, it was horrible. But... Um, but, of course, he remains this very difficult painter. And there is something that I can't really figure out, and that's what fascinates me. Really. And, of course, these Pitura Negras are exemplary. Anyway, some more images of that. And then we go back, back. What are we doing here? Yeah. So there are smaller inserts of that. Here you can see some more closer up. I'm going to make it a bit faster now, if you don't mind. I'm not going to bore you anymore. So these are the inserts of some more of this imagery, in a way. And a very old painting, La Nuque, the neck, which is actually, I pierced it with the backside of my pencil, sort of made a sort of, yeah, how do you call it? Uh, making a scar in the, in, in the surface. The rear mirror, which is an older painting, correspondence. The rear mirror is quite interesting because that's what you see what's behind you. And then we have eyeballs and hands from the Vita Gutmachung. And I think we still have one, the body painting, which is quite iconic too. And then I think we're nearly through the show. Well, some window. Well, we're going to go some... We're going to see some, these were the darkened spaces, you know, with works on paper, the site. I, for the first time, allowed things to be mixed, like this painting of mayhem. But I'm just going to go through it to just give you the feel. Uh, this, to give, like, this is the preliminary drawing of this sort of rear mirror. The other one was for our new quarters. This is actually Kristallnacht, so the drawing on this sort of green, nondescript backdrop. The Mayhem painting we can see closer up. This was made also, of course, after 9-11, and uh, with my fascination with Bruegel, in a sense. In Bruegel's paintings, people are very small. Like, not to say insignificant. So there is this sort of totally different humanistic stance to it. And when my wife and I came back after being sort of like caught up there for two weeks, and going to immigration in Brussels, I saw the painting of, a painting of Bruegel cut up in five light boxes on the way to immigration. 
And I said, this is the most apocalyptic image you can think of. And I found this image of a sort of paintball contest in Detroit. It's called, the painting's called Mayhem. Some more things, you know, the close-up missing person. It's painted on newspaper paper and then glued on wood. This is one of the spheres. This, was, this, was the, this is a polyester sphere, which I later on made in a real balloon that could float a weather balloon. And this is actually the theater of Ober Amagal painting on it. Some more images of that. Some images that were never painted, actually. This was the image, preliminary image of the blessing. Anyway, you get the drift. And then, so, up, a maquette of the correspondence painting, and here you have the maquette of the drum set, which is already a multiple because I made it in cardboard, and then we made it in 3D, in a sort of metal, and I repainted it and put this crepe on it. Anyway, up, some more images. Can go forever. Up. I really want to get out of it. So yeah, this is um, this is from the show Monarchy Toko. This is actually Chombe in the middle. There's the night of the murder, in which he played a decisive role. The minute after they shot him, uh, he's lifting his finger. And then the last image, which is the arena, which I talked about, the oldest films of that show, 1978. First image of violence and the mixed media image and the fascination with the unsharpness and film. And it also come, came together. Oof. That was it. Hello, thank you. Um, this might be a bit of a silly question, but can you maybe explain in one, like one more uh, sentence what this fascination with the like, totalitarian, the Disney, the, the, the kind of fascism of all kinds, um, and how you sort of deal with it via painting? Um, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. So it's actually the fascination with power. That's yeah, okay. basically what you're meaning. Well... I think, not that I, I'm fascinated with power, and I also want to deduct how it's organized not to have it, of course. I don't think artists or art should be, in that sense, attaining power. I think that's, that, that's very, very dangerous. But I'm fascinated by it. Also the fact that the idea of violence has always created much more imagery than happiness. The consequences are a bit larger, in a sense. And in that sense, on a sociological, sociological, political level, and the idea of boundaries, territories, all those elements, uh, once got loose from their abstract denominators, they have a clear and decisive impact. And that's what probably fascinates me. I mean, that's what triggers me in a sense. Not that I, as I said, in a moralistic way, in a quite very detached way, which makes it even worse. And also, in a way, with an exemplary form of tenderness, because the cruelest torture, or the cruelest way to torture somebody is to do it with a great deal of tenderness. Cold beer and tenderness. So, in a sense, that is a true fascination. And, as I said, it, it creates multiple and multiple of, 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 of imagery. I mean, uh, to, to, to give an example, I was once invited, because I did a show in the Hamburger Bahn over the Neue National Gallery, and it was in 90, uh, 2000. And I gave a lecture there, and I came across these four paintings, which I didn't show in detail, of Heydrich, you know, the guy that was responsible for the Wannsee Conference Villa, in which in three hours they decided, and he was sort of like presiding it, Three, in three hours, they decided how they were going to kill eight, nine million people and what the logistics would be. So when I gave the talk, I come across this one image on the slide. I said, fuck, I'm in Berlin. I'm going to go to this Wannsee Villa, which is, by then was a museum. 
So I, I, I got there at 9 o'clock at night, and, the, and the, the electric door opened the gate, and the director was still in the office. And we took the same elevator on which Eichmann, with the same chairs, Eichmann and Heidrich sat. And he wanted me to show the words that were dealing with this idea, like the gas chamber, that, in the villa. And I refused. I thought it was too difficult. But they did a colloquium, at the, the, the typical Germans, you know, did a colloquium at the end of the show, last day. And I take the plane. You could still fly to Tempelhof, which is also quite a fascist, you know, like, beautiful uh, uh, airport, which I should actually keep, kept, should have kept it. It's the middle of Berlin, and I drive on the former Stalin Allee at 9 o'clock in the morning. The lecture was at 10, straight out of Antwerp. And I see all these banners with Hitler and from Der Spiegel, which was Hitler und die Frauen, Hitler and women. So you could ask yourself, who won the war? <laughs> Certainly not the victims. So in that sense, that's an interesting point. In fact, you know, that Stalin killed about 450, maybe 50 million people, got, got away with it. Mao, even more. So this is a clear, fascinating divide. It's a, it's a pathological point, also to a point. In that sense, I'm against the Gesamtkunstwerk. I have grave doubts about the Gesamtkunstwerk in terms of Richard Wagner, or saying that film would be like the Gesamtkunstwerk. Or, or, no, nothing should be that, no, not at all. We should keep it dispersed, which is be a bit humble about. That's maybe a very long answer to your question. Somebody else? Hi. Yeah, after going through all the slides, it's clear that you draw from a lot of different sources of imagery. And I remember last year when you kind of got into troubled water about that. I was just wondering if you could talk about that and how that affected your practice. It didn't affect my practice for one zilch. I also, uh, we came to a good uh, solution with the photographer, uh, who actually turned out to be starstruck. And, uh, and, and it's just stupid cunt. I mean, the, the, thing is, the thing is that who instigated it? The news. The newspaper instigated it. And why did they instigate it? There were several reasons to do that. And so, so it was a, this is a typical sort of like example of the news that has no news to tell of. So we'll create it. We'll make a snowball effect out of it. And that's what they did. And also out of a deliberate uh, yeah, angle. I mean, there was, there was also political uh, reasoning behind that. The girl itself, the photographer, was as innocent and as abused as I was by, of course, Sharks' lawyers who saw money signs. And that eventually all didn't work out. The only thing it did is they were able, especially on the Flemish side, not the French side, because they didn't understand zilch of it, nor did the people abroad. But the Flemish really wanted to get to the arrogant motherfucker I was, which they did on the television with three people against me in the, t in the talk show, just shitting on me, which was great. I mean, let's, let's do that. So eventually they could, after 25 years, they could take it out. Fine. That's the only consequence of it. Now... That painting, which is still in the American collection, is an iconic painting. It's an iconic painting. And we're still allowed to show it, again to show it, to reproduce it, and all that. So it is uh, done, the story. It was ludicrous to begin with. Uh, to have to live with the fact that a Flemish, so of course, really uh, like certified good newspaper, has a chief editor of culture that asked the question in 2015 if it, would be a, if it could be a possibility to derive an artwork from a photographic image with 2015. We're going to shoot off like 150 years of art history. It's insane. So anyway, so whatever. It just gives you a pretty good picture of how small a country can be. So that's all I can say about it. Thank you. Um, I feel the many of your um, paintings involve the sense of the theatrical, such as corporate and also Disneyland, because um, in Disneyland this is sort of a simulacrum, and also I feel that in this painting, and um, it gives a sense of the like uh, stage set. And then you also mentioned about Gizam Kunstwerk, so just wondering if the theater um, inform your practice. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. Well uh, interesting question, but 
I, I actually, it's interesting that my very first print were not so much with individual artists, they were actually more poets or writers. And there were also actors, and there was a decisive link with theater yeah, in the 80s, in a sense. Not that I would be such a beautiful or good stenographer, but I was always fascinated by it. But, this, but the thing with, with, of course, the Wonderland thing is because it's really the backdrop of things. It's really fake, and it's really cardboard. And i sort of fascinated by that, not so much in the fact that, uh, not so much in an epic way, as you can see, but in really the fact that it's just that. Just cardboard. Thank you very much.